always hard, hardening to have the applause at the front end. Um, and I know uh, we're in for a wonderful discussion tonight. Uh, just to remind everybody, I am Mike Gerhardt, um, constitutional law professor from the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill, but also scholar in residence here at the National Constitution Center. And we welcome you to tonight's important discussion on the history of the Black Lives uh, Movement and its parallels with the civil rights movements of the past. Just a few logistical details at the beginning. Um, I'd like to take this time to say thank you to our members joining us today who make the National Constitution Center town hall programs possible. If anyone attending today's program is interested in becoming a member, please see the membership table outside the auditorium for more information. We'll be taking questions from the audience throughout the program via note cards. Please give the card to the staff members who are circulating up and down the aisles during the program. And lastly, please take a moment to silence your cell phones. And now it's my distinct pleasure and honor to be able to introduce our uh, participants and panelists tonight. Um, to my immediate left, Randall Kennedy is the Michael R. Klein Professor at Harvard Law School, where he teaches courses on contracts, criminal law, and the regulation of race matters. He has a remarkably distinguished record I wish we had time to go over, but it includes having been a law clerk for Judge J. Skelly Wright of the United States Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia and Justice Thurgood Marshall of the United States Supreme Court. And among his many honors uh, are included the 1998 Robert F. Kennedy Book Award for his book, Race, Crime, and the Law, and he writes for a wide range of scholarly and general interest publications. To his left is Aaron Haynes Wack, an award-winning reporter covering urban affairs for the Associated Press. And Aaron's recent reporting has included coverage of racial disparities around policing and communities of color. And she was on the ground in Ferguson, Missouri to cover the death of Michael Brown and the racial tensions that have emerged over the past two years. And to her left is Dr. Julianne Malvo, President Emerita of Bennett College for Women. She is an economist, author, a committed activist, and civil, uh, civic leader, and has held positions in women's civil rights and policy organizations. Please join her after the program in Kirby Lobby, where she'll be signing copies of her latest book, Are We Better Off Race, Obama, and Public Policy? Please join me in welcoming our distinguished panel. Aaron, I'm going to uh, turn to you first, but we're going to have each of you just tell us um, your thoughts about the question that um, we're meeting today to talk about, which is Black Lives Matter. Is it the new civil rights movement? OK, uh, starting with me. Well, good evening, everybody. Thank you guys so much for coming. I really appreciate you being here. Um, yeah, I think it's an interesting question, and it's one that we've asked a lot kind of since the Black Lives Matter movement was born and as we've watched it evolve. Uh, and, and you know, comparing this, uh, Black Lives Matter to the civil rights movement, to me, it really kind of puts a lot of a lot of weight on what really is kind of a new movement that we don't really know, you know, what it's going to be yet, right? Like, um, you know, sometimes I envision, you know, thinking about that. I, I envision Martin Luther King thinking, you know, did they compare me to, you know, whether or not I was going to be the next Frederick Douglass? You know, does that happen? Uh, you know, but I think that what we do know right now is that, you know, this movement is really part of a, you know, the continuum of struggle for Black freedom in America. Like, that is what we know right now today. Um, you know, but to the extent that we do, uh, you know, kind of draw those parallels, there certainly are parallels that can be drawn. I think that, uh, you know, you see that, uh, you know, both the Civil Rights Movement and Black Lives Matter were, were started and, and led, you know, largely by young or youngish uh, people. Um, I think that, uh, you know, we also know that um, what you had was people who were not necessarily, you know, professional activists, you know, that's a popular word now, right, professional protesters. Like, these were not professionals at doing that, but what they were were people who, you know, had lost, um, you know, who had a lot of skin in the game and who, frankly, were sick and tired of the status quo and were really, um, you know, demanding that things not be the same anymore, and they had a real sense of urgency around that. Um, you know, tying it uh, kind of to what I do, I think that both of those movements um, were marked by their ability to kind of harness the national spotlight, although I think that we see that Black Lives Matter uh, has been able to do that very differently with the advent of technology. 
um, you know, but the media definitely was very um, central to both of those movements. But when you have, you know, a president of the United States, when you have a, you know, an attorney general that are on Twitter, you know, it's much easier to access them. You know, you were even able, you know, in some cases to bypass, you know, traditional media like me uh, to reach uh, those audiences, um, you know, just in a way that we weren't able to before. Um, and so, you know, I think, uh, you know, we've seen, like I said, that evolution. We've seen uh, Black, Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter kind of going from, uh, you know, the, the front lines of protest into policy, you know, calling for what, uh, you know, what exactly are those, you know, demands going to be, you know, what, what are they asking for? You know, a lot of, you know, why people said, you know, that the Occupy movement, for example, was not as successful was because, you know, we didn't know what they wanted. You know, we didn't know, you know, specific things that they, uh, you know, had as goals, you know, whereas you had, like, you know, even going back to slavery, like abolition was about ending slavery. So, you know, that was what they wanted. You know, the civil rights movement was calling for the end of segregation and, you know, voting rights for black people. Like that was what they wanted. I mean, Black Lives Matter, though, I think it's pretty they are calling for, you know, the end of, you know, the disproportionate killing of black people, you know, by police in America. Like that is what they are calling for. That has not yet happened. Uh, but that is the goal. Um, it is not their fault that that has not yet happened, you know, in the same way that it was not Martin Luther King's fault, you know, that, that Jim Crow persisted and that, you know, black people were still unable to vote even as he was, you know, um, you know, working towards that goal, even as he was working towards the goal as people, you know, being able to go wherever they wanted and, 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 and to have that full citizenship that, that, you know, everybody should have as Americans. Like, it was not his fault that those things did not happen while he was working for those things. And so, uh, you know, that's really what I would, you know, I think that we're still, we're still waiting to see, you know, if, you know, Black Lives Matter ends up being a question in this country or a statement. Um, just as we were waiting to see, you know, if black people were going to get, you know, civil rights, uh, you know, while that was what, you know, so many of our brothers and sisters were working for uh, during that era. Thank you. Randy, nobody's been a more thoughtful commentator on race, crime, and the law than you. Black Lives Matter, is it a new civil rights movement? I think that Black Lives Matter is just the most recent iteration of uh, struggles that have been going on for centuries in the United States. Yep. I mean, since black people came to the United States as slaves, black people have been uh, fighting uh, racial mistreatment. And uh, that has taken on various guys as black people have been doing everything possible to resist their subjugation. They've been marching, they've been praying in, sitting in, standing in, standing up, uh, petitioning, trying to expose uh, their subjugation through propaganda, through journalism, sometimes through the resort, through uh, revolt. And, um, this has taken on many guises, and Black Lives Matter is simply uh, most recent. There, it's, so it's, it's, it's part of, a, it's, it's, it's marked by continuity. Are there some things that are different about it? Sure, there's some things that are different about it. So one thing that's different about it, if you compare Black Lives Matter to the great movement of the Second Reconstruction, so oftentimes you know, called the, the, the Civil Rights Movement, mm -hmm. uh, Black Lives Matter, that, that very term, the imagery of Black Lives Matter, was coined by uh, three young women of color. Mm -hmm. And women have been very salient, very central in Black Lives Matter. Women, of course, were very important in the Civil Rights Movement, though they were, all, they were marginalized in the yeah. Civil Rights Movement, very marginalized. If one thinks about one of the great marches, uh, you know, the Great March on Washington, 1963, where Martin Luther King gives his great I Have a Dream speech, there was not one woman who gave one of the major addresses. Well, Black Lives Matter, women are very central. Another way in which Black Lives Matter is a bit different has to do with sexuality. The, the, uh, a number of people who are at the center of Black Lives Matter have been very outspoken in asserting their, um, their sexuality as, uh, as, as, as gay people, as lesbian, and have insisted that Black Lives Matter has to be about elevating the fortunes 
of all black people, not just straight black people, all black people. That's been a very central thing. Hmm. And then finally, I think that the central issue with Black Lives Matter, obviously Black Lives Matter has talked about the various ways in which uh, African Americans are menaced by uh, racial discrimination, but the center point of Black Lives Matter has been about the administration of criminal justice. Mm -hmm. And um, the administration of criminal justice has been an area in American life that has been peculiarly resistant to racial reform. I mean, with respect to the second reconstruction, you know, employment discrimination, housing discrimination, disfranchisement, uh, those things were, were, were obviously, you know, weren't successfully dealt with, but there were important inroads made against racism in those areas. With respect to the administration of criminal justice, um, the Second Reconstruction did not make deep inroads at all. And that's one of the reasons why at this late date, we face racism in a very bald and open and brutal fashion. And that's why Black Lives Matter, I think, has really resonated because they have focused on something that touches people in their day-to-day -day lives, um, you know, so, so so clearly, so strongly, um, and so those are some of the ways in which I think Black Lives Matter has continuity, but also discontinuity. Okay, well, thank you, and we're going to get into some of those things, of course. Julianne, you've also written passionately and eloquently about our topic: uh, Black Lives Matter. Is it a new civil rights movement? Well, you know, there's always been an oscillation between progress and regress. Uh, in the, uh, among African American people. We saw enormous progress after 1865, the passage, of course, of the of 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, the emancipation. Then we saw the reaction in terms of Jim Crow. Um, and we've seen this go back and forth, back and forth. I am a 60s child, and proudly so. And uh, we saw a lot of changes. I mean, I'm a, not only am I a 60s child, I'm a San Francisco, California 60s child. Oh, okay. <laughs> so that, that, get, that gives you a little extra context. Um, and so we saw my brothers take empty guns to Sacramento to assert that uh, African-American men also had the right mm -hmm. to carry arms. We saw the Black Panther Party walk behind the police and hold them accountable keeping notebooks on, they stopped this person here, there, and everywhere. Um, so, 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 so your point, uh, Professor Kennedy, uh, we have always looked at these things and we have not always been but so successful. And I want to talk about progress and regress from the perspective of the fact that the young people, the Black Lives Matter movement, are the children of the 60s and 70s people. In other words, that, that Gen X group kind of was pretty happy who, who and where they were. Uh, it was all pretty good. Uh, there, you, and you could talk to young, black, white, Latino, Asian young people, and they were like, you know, we all get along. And then you saw, which we always saw, but with more because of social media, because of everything else, we kept seeing people being killed. We kept seeing no way to justify it. And so Black Lives Matter comes out of the complacency of the Gen X folks who did not feel that they could take the baton from the 60s and 70s children and say, we need to keep up the struggle. We have the veneer of progress with the reality of not so much progress. Mm -hmm. And so what these young people have done mm -hmm. in their absolute brilliance and their absolute pain is stepped up and said no mm -hmm. and no more. And so yes, in many ways they are the inheritors of the dream. The challenge I think we face is that there is a diffusion among these millennials that many of them are highly educated. Um, the children of the Ivies see the world one way, the homies in the hood see it quite another way. And, there, and should the twain ever meet. I think the other piece of this that's very important to me is the extent to which social media, I call it faux activism. Mm. 
you cannot hashtag your way to freedom. You know, I mean, there is no substitute for going door to door. There's no substitute for organizing. And so I, th I think that a lot of folks, you know, you Twitter it and you think that that means something. No. Um, so the movement of black lives who've come out with a very powerful policy paper, a very powerful policy paper that doesn't just talk about criminal justice, but also connects uh, economics yes. and many other things. I think that's very powerful. It takes you past this notion of laying across railroad tracks. Now, like I told the young people in Oakland, some of my children, my friends, they say, you go come out. I'm like, you know, I'm too old. I, if I lay down over railroad tracks, how many of y'all going to get me up? This is not going to happen easily. Um, and I think that, that we have to, and I, I'm very sensitive to this for any number of reasons, uh, because many of the young people that I mentor, um, both as a former college president and just in a number of other ways, are in their late 20s, early 30s. We have to be sensitive to the generational mm -hmm. differences uh, mm -hmm. that exist and the different ways that we basically manifest activism. And I think that when we pay attention to that, pay attention to that generational difference, because I'm stunned at, for, I, for example, nobody has cursed in here today, so I will. That would be called uh, chump. Um, the T word, the chi word, the, that person who plans to be the president of the United States unless, well, anyway. Um, but I'm stunned at the number of millennials who were not willing to vote because they didn't think it made a difference. And I'm stunned at the number of, I mean, Brittany Packnett, who I think is brilliant and wonderful, took until late October. Uh, she's mm -hmm. a Black Lives Matter leader, until late October to choose totally. to endorse Hillary. Uh, what's his name? DeRay, DeRay McKesson, McKesson right. also. Uh, so thinking that Trump and Hillary, both extraordinarily flawed, were the same thing, is like thinking that you're going to eat strychnine as opposed to hot sauce. You know, I mean, it just doesn't. So it seems to me that some of the generational stuff are conversations that we have to have. But, the, but they're the same conversations that our elders had with us. I, my, one of my nephews, who's 33, got his hands on a picture of me from, the, um, from 1969, actually. And uh, the platform shoes were up to there. Mini skirt was up to here. The afro was out to there. And he said, Aunt Julianne, how dare you tell me to pull my pants up? <laughs> he said, you should have pulled your skirt down. <laughs> and I'm like, uh, Sonny. So there's always been generational conflict, but I don't think it's ever been so stark that people would turn on their own interest because we don't teach civics, because we haven't had the intergenerational conversation. So while Black Lives Matter, may be the next iteration of the civil rights movement. I would ask, as you did, Aaron, for us to look back and see how was Dr. King and his movement accepted with the establishment? How was John Lewis? Remember, he had to bogard. Yeah, I was going to say, He had to bogard. They were not going to let him say what he had to say. He just bogarded. How was he accepted in the context of the establishment? And how do we begin, if we're talking about the next iteration of the civil rights movement, make the civil rights movement more comprehensive so that we do deal not only with people of African descent, but with others and with the whole GBLTQ issue, okay. which the African American community has often not been at the foreground of. And um, so there's, so there's it, it's, it's like a Rubik's Cube. And it's an exciting Rubik's Cube, I think, uh, because I think it's interesting to see how it's all going to play out, especially in the context of the world according to Trump. Well, we've only touched on so many themes um, that it will be almost impossible to cover them all, but let's try. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, so Aaron, um, I want to then come back to you and um, begin to ask the question uh, about concrete things. That is to say, is the movement leading to particular legal developments or are there particular um, social or other kinds of uh, specific developments you think this movement might lead to? For example, Randy had mentioned the second 
founding, which includes, of course, the, among other things, the great civil rights legislation of the 60s. Sure. To what extent do you see this as leading to particular developments? Uh, well, I think you've definitely seen them kind of evolve into wanting to discuss specific policy issues around policing, right? Because I think that what um, Black Lives Matter has helped to uncover is that the system, as it is currently designed, is working exactly in the way it is supposed to, and that is the reason one one of the main reasons that you're getting the outcomes that continue to happen, mm -hmm. right? I mean, it's how you can have a video of a black man being shot in the back, you know, recorded, and you know, public opinion says, oh, well, this is open and shut, and then you have a mistrial, or you know, you you continue you're referring to, have, to the South Carolina. I'm referring today, to right? yes, what just happened in the Michael Michael Slager case. Um, it, it, it's how. People can not understand, like you know, how does how does what the public thinks and what ends up happening, you know, in a courtroom, like how are those things so different? Well, that has to do with the law in part, um, and the law in part, you know, hope, you know, why police officers are not prosecuted, you know, as often as you would think that they should be prosecuted. And by you, I mean like the public generally thinks, oh well, surely that person is going to be prosecuted, and then it doesn't happen, and it doesn't happen, and it doesn't happen. And it's like, well, that's. You know, they're op you know, these district attorneys are, op are operating within the confines of, you know, the laws that are currently on the books. Um, you know, they're pushing for, you know, body cameras, you know, in police departments being used. Mm -hmm. They're pushing for, you know, you, you had in Ferguson these onerous fees and fines that, that you know, were, were being placed upon the people who were living there. And it's like, well, it's, okay, so we need to address these fees and fines so that this doesn't keep happening, you know, to people there. So, you know, they're asking for specific things uh, related to dismantling a system that is that is not working, you know, because until you change that, I mean, protesting, hashtagging, you know, all the rest of that, um, raising awareness, uh, I think was definitely the first very very important step to this. But um, you know, recognizing, okay, these are the policy areas that we need to target. Oh, who are elected officials besides the president, besides the attorney general, the people on a local level, and so you had Black Lives Matter people getting involved in you know, elections at the, the state and, and, and even you know, more granular level. Um, you had you know, district attorneys in you know, Chicago and Cleveland being gone mm -hmm. you know, after uh, you know, they didn't get the results that, that, that folks wanted in those cities um, around you know, the Tamir Rice case and uh, the Laquan McDonald case. And so you, know, you are seeing um, you know, kind of that activism also happening uh, on a policy front, uh, which is something that, that definitely needs to happen because otherwise you're just kind of pointing out, okay, well, this is the situation that is happening and then nothing happens from there. I appreciate it. So Randy, I obviously I want to, want to ask you as well about it, what legal developments this may uh, come to. But if I may, I'm going to ask you a compound question. <laughs> um, uh, because the other thing I, I've, I've noticed, um, at least just to, even among our panel, is we all have a Southern connection. Yeah. Uh, we've all lived in the South or come from the South. Is this this isn't just Southern. So uh, um, although it may lead one to think uh, like the prior civil rights movement did, that it's only about just the South. So as we think about concrete legal developments, I'm thinking about to what extent are they national? Two things. First, on the question of has black lives mattered in a concrete way, I can say I, I think it has. In, I, I, I'm a law professor. There has been more discussion in law schools about the law of the police in the last few years, there's been more discussion in the last, let's say, three years mm -hmm. than in the previous 15. Mm -hmm. In law schools all over the country, new, you know, news courses, what, what are the regulations governing the police? People didn't know. Mm -hmm. I certainly did. Until the, the demonstrations, I think of, for instance, the, um, in Baltimore, mm -hmm. it came out the laws that, you know, bend over backwards uh, to actually um, insulate the police from mm -hmm. scrutiny. P I, I didn't know about that. And, and, and by the way, I think a lot of people did. Um, the whole question of, you, you mentioned uh, cameras, you mentioned the way in which technology can be utilized to bring to the fore, to keep evidence, mm -hmm. to bring to the fore, well, you know, what did the police do? I think that there's been lots of discussion. I think that 
you know, one issue in, in the United States uh, over the past few years has been the whole question of the, um, the role of government. So that you have people who, you know, for instance, um, conservatives say, you know, listen, uh, government has to be restrained. There has to be accountability. There has to be transparency. Uh, we have to be on, on, on the lookout for corruption. We have to be on the lookout for uh, uh, excessive you know, government action. What better place than to take a look at the police? It's the police, <laughs> if you just, for regular people, it's the police officer who regular people come into contact with the most. And I think it's because, interestingly enough, of Black Lives Matter that people who ideologically are very, very far from Black Lives Matter, conservatives, I said, gosh, you know, yeah, the police, yeah, they have to be held accountable. We have to be very careful that police are kept, um, you know, restrained. So I think there's been a lot of um, consciousness raising. I think there has been uh, activity on the ground. You mentioned this whole thing. When the, the United States Justice Department over the past few years has gone into place after place yeah. after place and revealed yes. the way in which police authorities have been acting in a way uh, that is just completely unacceptable. And not just revealed, but, but you know they're what? also... It's, 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 on, on, the, on, the, on your second, just, on, just right. quickly, on the second thing, I'll say that it was true in the 1960s that although there was a lot of attention placed, and for good reason, placed on the South, the fact of the matter is that there was... It's never been the case that the race problem was only a Southern problem. Yeah. It's always been a national problem. Yeah. And, and Black Lives Matter has helped expose that And as absolutely. Well. So, I mean, okay. the, the, with respect to the police, Cincinnati. I mean, you know, the, in, in the last Cincinnati couple of days, you know, the, you know, the New York Times has talked about the, yes. the prison system right. in New York City. Yes. If we think about, you know, if we think about police action, the, frankly, there is a police problem, a police slash race problem throughout the United States of America, not just in the South. Mm -hmm. Julianne. A couple things. Um, you know, Randy, you have such a good point. I hope that everyone here has the opportunity to go to the National Museum for African American History and Culture you mean the in Washington. The Blacksonian. Pardon? The Blacksonian. My, my favorite place in America. No, I call the I call it by its name. You no, call it what you want to call place. it. But I call it by. But here's the Beautiful deal. Place. I did not know. I'm a native Californian, native San Francisco. I did not know that San Fr that California had miscegenation laws mm -hmm. until 1946. Yes. That um, soldiers who married Japanese women had to register them in the 1945-1946 period. That virtually every state, I think Massachusetts may be the sole exception, had laws about Arizona. They didn't have no black people in Arizona, <laughs> but they had miscegenation laws. I mean, maybe they had one or two. Um, and I guess they didn't want them to get married. Um, but yeah, but so it's a so we, we really can't talk about it as a southern thing. It, the southern trees bear some strange fruit, and the fruit often lands in the north. Uh, from that perspective, if you look at Oakland, California in particular, and the police, the Oakland police were recruited from the Deep South. And so when you saw the amount of violence that happened toward black people in Oakland, it was because these police officers were coming from Alabama and Mississippi and Louisiana and Georgia, and they were trained to just beat on black people whenever, however, whatever. There are cases upon cases upon cases of professional African Americans who weren't even driving new cars. Now, you know, black people new cars, that's a problem. But they had old cars, and they still were pulled over, stopped, humiliated, and all of that. So I, I think your point about the South is important. I think it's important to understand that if you swim in racist water, you will get racism on your gills. And the United States is racist water. And basically, whether you're in Florida, Massachusetts, uh, Pennsylvania, y'all know, y'all here, y'all know the W.B. Du Bois story, who was not allowed to be a professor 
at the University of Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania, who they developed the unique title for him with a PhD from Harvard as assistant instructor. Not instructor, but assistant instructor. So it's everywhere, and, and, and we have to own that. But then when we talk about Black Lives Matter, what I find most uh, challenging is the resistance to Black Lives Matter. Mm -hmm. So the people who, white lives matter, all lives matter, blue lives matter, whatever. Now, the only reason that the hashtag Black Lives Matter exists is because black lives did not always matter. As we have now learned when we're looking at this electoral college, and I know my constitution, constitutional law brother will correct me if I'm wrong, but I ain't. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but in any case, we know that the electoral college was designed to make sure that Southerners had more power than they should have. If you cannot define a person as a person who could vote, how could they be three-fifths of a person who would count for you to have more power? And so Black Lives Matter comes out of the soil that said that black lives did not matter. Mm -hmm. And so this, all this resistance and pushback is frightening from the perspective of people who are unwilling to acknowledge the extent to which black lives have been su systematically devalued. Absolutely. And then beyond that, I think it's important when we look at some of that to note the very many ways that um, it's just not, the police thing is huge. And for our young people, especially young men, because, you know, it's just random. You know, I, I think in DC they said one of three black men has been stopped for something at some point in time uh, that, that Trump would uh, put um, sessions and consider Giuliani mm -hmm. as uh, attorney general, the kings of stop and frisk, when we know that in New York, what was it, 1% of those who were stopped and frisked had anything wrong with them? Um, when whether it was a hood rat or a Butch Graves Jr., Earl Graves' son, thrown down on the ground, you know, satorically attired, but just black. Sure. You know, just black. So I think that it's important to understand. And so for, for, for my good white and non-black friends, that resistance is something that has to be unpacked. Yes. To have a conversation about why do you, why is it so challenging to embrace the notion that black lives matter? Okay. You know, why can, why, why can we not just say there is a history that requires us to assert ourselves? It's just like James Brown saying, say a lot, I'm black and I'm proud. Didn't mean y'all couldn't be proud, y'all been proud all your lives. Uh, you walk into any senatorial, you know, uh, Ron Dell was the first one, Armed Services Committee, first black picture of all those chairs. Uh, what's her name? Uh, Mrs. Cosby, Camille, yeah. years ago when her son was killed, mm -hmm. saying, I reject the money of this country because there are no black people on the money. Still no black people on the money. We might get sojourner one of these days, but now with well. Trump coming in, we don't know what we're going to get. Um, probably Melania. And that would be a problem. Um, <laughs> forgive my flippancy, I just can't help well, it. Well, let me, uh, let me, let me, but, but, let me. But, but the bottom line that, I, I'm, I'm gonna stop because I know I do, I do digress. But the bottom line here is that in order for, Milan Karinga, who is a dear friend and a brilliant man, talked about reparations very recently. And what he said about reparations, which again, white folks tend to resist, is that reparations is not only about money, it's about repair. Mm -hmm. It's about repairing communities. If you can repair the African-American community, we can repair America. The fact is that we live in a dirty, filthy, flawed country. That we can fix. That has a basis and a foundation. That's fixable. But we have to own the fact that we want repair. And that's, to me, what Black Lives Matter is about. Well, so, I would be remiss as a Southerner if I did not chime in on this one thing. And that would be to say, you know, the South is really one of the biggest, I would say, uh, exports within this country that, that we have. I mean, we're sitting here in Philadelphia, the third most popular stop on the Great Migration. Like, 
I don't care, if, 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 all of you who were born here, I mean, if there's a black person born here, like I want to know where your grandparents were from, because it wasn't Philadelphia. Like, yeah, I mean, for everybody, it was not Philadelphia, right? It was somewhere that they came from the South on a train to flee, mm. you know, the oppression that they were going through in Jim Crow to get, you know, north somewhere, right? My husband is from Chicago, but his father's family is from Charleston and his mother's family is from Georgia. Like, like there, there are no black people that are not Southern in some way, at some point, if you go back a little way. Also, you've got, you know, what you had, um, you know, you had, so you had that manufacturing in the North that was recruiting black people. They were also recruiting white people from Appalachia. Mm. And so those folks were coming from different parts of the country, some from different parts of the South, to work in factories as well. And so you had that collision. So you've got the South operating all over this country, even though, yes, we are a very particular region, and, and, and there is that, that piece of it, too. Well, of course, we have a lot of themes um, we're, we're touching on and overlapping. Uh, and, and so, Randy, I... I want um, to take us back to the law to some extent and um, see if there's a, a, a constitutional legal framework. You, you've begun talking about it, of course. But I also want to link it up to um, this most recent election. Uh, the, for this movement to endure, um, it endures at a time um, in which the, uh, we've had an election which some might think is a repudiation to some extent of the movement. But I want to ask the question, is there a way to reconcile the movement with what we see is likely to be occurring in Washington, D.C.? Mm. Well, <laughs> I, I, I think, I think President, Work with me here. <laughs> I, think that, I think that President Malveaux, I mean, you know, in, in a way, that's right, history, there's, there's pendulum movement. Uh, there are advances, and every time there has been advancement toward racial justice, equality, decency in the United States, there has been pushback. Absolutely. We should not be surprised by that. And when there is pushback, there will be pushback against the pushback. So, I mean, in, in a way, it's not, I mean, actually nothing that's going on should be surprising in the sense that, uh, you know, th there's going to be contestation. There are going to be, there is going to be polarization. There is going to be division. And, you know, that's just going to be, that's just, that's been part of our history. It seems to me that's part of our future. Now, one thing I'd say about the, the, you know, the discourse over Black Lives Matter, um, I think it really is important for people, one of the things that I think is very useful about forums like this is for people to talk and for people to talk openly. Um, I think it is the case. I've certainly had friends, thoroughly decent people, who have who have said to me, "Gosh, you know, I, I'm 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 really I'm, uh, I'm 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 very disturbed by what I've seen and heard about you know police misconduct." We'll talk about it, and then we'll talk a little bit further. We'll get relaxed, we'll be talking, we'll be talking, we'll be talking, and then at a certain point when they feel relaxed, they'll, they'll say, you know, I do have this thing about you know, black lives matter. Right. <laughs> Is there the suggestion, sort of you know, the implicit suggestion that other lives don't matter as much? And they'll ask me about that. Now, I, I think, that, you know, the, the fact of the matter is that that is on people's minds. Well, that and means they are... don't know history, Randy. That means they well, don't but, know but history. Well, but hold it. Maybe they don't. Well, maybe they, let's suppose that they don't. But the fact of the matter is these are folks, and like I've said, I've talked with people, good folks. Good folks. And the, 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 and the point is, how does one talk? Yes. Because, I mean, we have to be engaged. Yes. In public but, education, it's not enough. It's hold it, good. hold it. It's not enough to say. It's not enough, as far as I'm concerned, to say to somebody. If somebody asks me a question like that, I can't simply say, 
you don't know history. They're asking me a question. I've got to respond. I think that your response was a very fine response. It seems to me the response is, Black Lives Matter is perfectly fine as a statement because all lives matter, including black people. And what you've got to understand is that against the backdrop, against the backdrop of American history, black lives haven't been mattering. That's why people have had to assert yes. that black lives matter. Understand that, and we have mm -hmm. to talk about that. And it seems to me that in sessions like this, we need to unpack, talk, go back and forth, including, you know, uh, disagreements. But I think that in sessions like this, we really do have to talk about everything. Well, the, and I think but to your you point, know, the talking whiteness is, is a important. powerful PR machine. Whiteness is a very powerful PR machine, and therefore, we are always people of color are always assumed to be other. In other words, folks, and I don't mean to diss anybody by saying they don't know history. I'll, I'll, yeah, I, I think that means they need to learn history. But I do think that we somehow have made it okay for people not to know history. I think our curricula ignore history. I think if you go south of the Mason-Dixon line, I have a godchild in Georgia, they still teaching the Confederate flag. I was gonna say that. You know, I mean, they're still, they, they still haven't got it through their thick skulls that the Confederates lost. I mean, you know, I mean, any place else, you know, you kick to the curb, you lost, go away. But, um, so I, you know, I, I, I think that much of this is about white people confronting their stuff and however we choose to be interpreters is fine, but I, but I don't think that if we deal with the emerging demography, mm -hmm. which will have white folks as a minority by 2040 or 50, that we let folk, quote, off the hook, and it's not that they're on the hook, but it's a conversation about hook and about what you choose to know. And if you choose not to know, Black Lives Matter and all the rest of this stuff is gonna be up in your face. You can be mad, you can have power for a minute, but it ain't gonna be there forever. Well, and if from a demographic perspective, young black and brown people are going to be supporting old white people via the social security system. Mm -hmm. Just think about that. So, uh, <laughs> just think about that. We are I mean, definitely to your point, uh, it, it cannot be only on black people to be, to be educating people on that history. Like, and also to your point, you know, if you are somebody who, who does believe in, you know, the idea of Black Lives Matter, be you black, white, or whatever, if you believe in that phrase and you are interested in starting those conversations and building relationship to the point at which you are probably going to have that conversation with somebody, well, what about Black Lives Matter? Get your answer ready. Be ready to have the conversation because when you get in conversation and you get in relationship with people, it will come up because that, that means that that person is comfortable enough with you, they feel mm -hmm. safe enough with you to broach the very prickly, very uh, taboo, and very uncomfortable, <coughs> frankly, for a lot of people, topic of race. And so when they are actually able to get to that point with you where they feel safe enough to say, well, all right, maybe I won't sound stupid in front of Aaron. What about Black Lives Matter? Be ready to answer that question so that they can be educated in that moment. Is it our responsibility as black people to do that alone? No, it is not. No, it should not be that. And when and white person, when you when you get that knowledge and get that education, tell a friend. You know, because it's not enough for us to just be having you know this conversation amongst each other. It's going to take it. It's going to take people hearing it, frankly, from people who look like them also, that this is a thing that they value and a thing that's important to them. You know, Malcolm X was once asked by a young white girl, what can we do mm -hmm. for black liberation? And his response was educate your people. Right. You know, his response was educate your people. He didn't want, you know, black folks, not, we're not sitting here with our hands held out. We're simply saying there are some realities yes. that brilliant people regardless of race, get. And so the Malcolm response was the perfect response. Educate your people. So um, I'm going to uh, 
come back to um, Randy on this, partly because it's your turn, but also I want to bring the audience into this, of course. Um, we have some fabulous questions from the audience, and we have about 10 seconds to ask all these wonderful questions. <laughs> um, but we're going to do our best. Um, so the, part of the premise of this question, I'm not suggesting that it, it ought to be attributed to you, Randy, but I, I don't like to edit the questions too much, and so I'm just going to ask this particular question, which draws on some of the stuff we're talking about, and I'm going to work through some of the other questions. Um, this question is, what are your specific fears about Republican dominance of our federal system for the next few years? What possible benefits can you imagine there might be from the fact that we've got a Republican administration, um, both in the White House and the, the Congress, uh, starting this January? Um, well, I mean, da, da, totally, da, 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 to, to be totally da. candid with you, I think that um, we have suffered an electoral catastrophe. Um, I, you know, and, and by the way, uh, in, in my writing, I have generally been, uh, with respect to discussions of race matters, I have been uh, on the optimistic side of things. I think that there has been considerable um, advance I think that uh, over the past you know, 50 to 60 years, in some instances, quite remarkable advances. I think that uh, there are aspects of our country with respect to the race question that are actually, you know, in a, you know quite admirable things uh, have happened. I think, however, that over the past year, um, I've had to, and will continue to, I'll have to recalibrate because what has happened over the past year has really been quite surprising. Um, it used to be the case, for instance, I used, to, I used to say that one of the great achievements of the Second Reconstruction was to make the, um, uh, to make uh, open racism unacceptable. I thought that was one of the, probably the chief mm. achievement of the Second Reconstruction. That's kind of true. Well, not true. <laughs> that is no, simply, no, I mean, no. it's, it's tragic. It is absolutely tragic. But we have seen people vying for the highest positions of government openly make, make statements that were, oh, should have been absolutely disqualified. And instead of them being disqualifying, they have been rewarded. So you ask me, do I see, frankly, anything good? No, I do not. And as an attorney, I mean, as an attorney, I mean, one <laughs> aspect of this that's very much on my mind has to do, for instance, with the Supreme Court of the United States. And what do I think is going to happen to the Supreme Court of the United States in the coming years? I think that the Supreme Court of the United States is going to be drawn in a way that is, um, that is going to be adverse to liberty, equality, and justice for all. So frankly, I don't have, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm not happy about this. I'm deeply disturbed about it. But do I have virtually, do I have really anything to say in so far, hopeful to say? The only hope I have is that we still live in a nation that uh, does have openings for people to engage in dissent and opposition, and I hope that people will take full advantage of that and uh, as quickly as possible put an end uh, to, the, uh, uh, to, the, to the tendencies that have unfortunately uh, been ascendant as of late. So Julianne, um, let, yeah. let me come back to this uh, because you, um, y all of us have talked about the election in one way or another, but I wanna talk about an aspect of the election um, which I don't know that we've touched upon, and that is whether or not it does create an opening or at least an awareness of the importance of local and state government. Um, that is to say, the extent to which uh, you know, our, our wonderful president here, Jeff Rosen, wrote a wonderful piece in the New York Times recently about how maybe 
something we need to rediscover is the importance of states as laboratories for progressive um, movements, progressive legal developments. Would you agree with that? Uh, absolutely. I think that one of the things, a couple of things that are very interesting. Uh, much of the progressive legislation that we've seen has bubbled up, mm -hmm. not come down. So, for example, the fight for 15, of the whole notion of a living wage, we've seen it in Washington state. We've seen it in about 30 cities mm -hmm. where their minimum wage is higher than the federal minimum wage, where people are really assessing what it costs to live and what it means to live. Um, and so I think that that's been very important. I think also, if we go back and look, there have been some pivotal times when conservatives have really taken over and what has happened. Number one will be the 1980 election of Ronald Reagan, which really dealt with issues of deregulation. And that deregulation hit consumers very hard. Uh, the number two time would be when the um, contract on America, contract on America, was uh, declared by that new person. Um, and I find it very difficult to be respectful, so y'all forgive me. I know I'm supposed to call him honorable or something, or dishonorable. But anyway, when the contract on America was declared, it was also about a trickling up from mm -hmm. you know, state and local governments. We saw in 1974 um, school board members being elected, and those school board members then moving up. And those school board members were very conservative, and as they moved up, they maintained their conservatism. So now progressive people, moderates, uh, the left, have to look at those races which we have tended to ignore. I think while I am totally horrified by what we see coming up with uh, that person, um, and the other day, this man told me that he said the only time he heard the president refer to that person is when conservatives talked about Franklin Roosevelt. I said, okay, okay, I've been good company, that person. So when that person um, attempts to assume the presidency, what I would also say is that we effed up. Progressives, liberals, white women, I'm so mad at white women. I mean, I really am. I mean, 53% of white women voted for Trump, and the college-educated white women who are supposed to be Hillary's base, 51% went for her, 46% went for Trump. Give me a break. But the issue, and this is not unusual, is that we had 95 million people stay home. Now, that's not unusual. Usually, we don't get but 55 57%. 58 was the highest we got in a long time, and that was from, for President Obama in eight. But the, so, so when you talk about state and local, it's also a wake-up call. In 2018, there are gonna be 33 senatorial seats mm -hmm. available. 23 of them are Democratic. Two are independent, Bernie Sanders and Angus King in Maine. And then eight are Republican. So it's our job now to look at those states. Pennsylvania is one. Michigan, where Clara Stabenow is up. Um, look at those states where Trump won to see what that means for senatorial possibilities. And Ralph Nader, who I very rarely, ya, 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 but he and, Ta and Howard Dean have talked about a 50-state strategy. See, what we learned from this election is that you just can't be picking Ohio, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin. That this is a 50-state country. And that, so, um, so you know, Hillary never went to Milwaukee. Right. She never went to Milwaukee. And there were 50,000 votes left on the table in Milwaukee where there ain't nothing but black people. It's against a lot to be white in Milwaukee. Um, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> But, but, so, so, but so in any case, your question is a good question because it really lays out the groundwork for the kind of organizing that we have to do moving ahead. And the organizing we have to do is not national organizing. You can't, neither, you can't hashtag your way to freedom, but you can't commercial it either. Right. And so all these little commercials about he's a horrible person, you know, what Hillary Clinton did not do is tell people what was exciting about her, exactly. that was messed up about him. Exactly. We knew he was messed up. You can look at the man with his pineapple head and see that he was messed up. But that was irrelevant 
What's relevant is how we get folks out. So the, so the job is not only, voting is not the most you can do, voting is literally the least you can do. Well, it's also, it's also, of course, a way to link up the importance of a rights movement of the 1960s with current issues. That is to say, voting rights and litigation and legislation relating to voting rights are critical in the year 2016 and moving forward. Mm -hmm. And I say that as somebody from the state of North Carolina. Absolutely. Where and your state, we not only please. have a major um, litigation it argued today in the United States Supreme Court, but also, the state of North Carolina is where a Democratic governor-elect was just named, yep. um, Roy Cooper. Um, a reminder of the salience of local and state elections, mm -hmm. Aaron, I want to bring you back to the Black Lives Movement and how it might become involved in, this, uh, in the struggle for voting rights. Um, can, can we link up our discussion about black, this movement with voting rights? Yeah, I mean, so I think uh, to Julian's point earlier about, you know, really reiterating, and, and I don't, you know, advocate one way or the other for, you know, whether or not people should vote. I mean, I personally believe that voting is very important. I'm a Southerner. I've never missed an election. That's just me. You know, my mama was checking the rolls, you know, in our precinct all the time. But I don't, but the fact of the matter is, all young people do not feel that way. And on a certain level, I definitely get it. Like for some people, it does not matter who is president on January 19th and who is president on January 20th. For them, their circumstance does not change. Like they do not feel that their circumstance is gonna change in any way. Um, you know, for people who are living in poverty, they were poor four years ago, they were poor four years before that, their mama was poor, their grandma was poor. Like they just don't see how it changes you know, with who is president of the United States, and they so they don't but they understand. Are wrong. I t totally agree with you. I mean, I think that Ferguson was very illuminating. They don't get more poll. Ferguson was very illuminating for a lot of people when you looked and you saw the mayor, and you know who they're thinking. Oh well, this person makes only a couple hundred bucks a month. You know, surely they don't have any power. Well, actually, they do have quite a lot of power. These are the people that are the reason that you have all these warrants, these bench warrants, and these are the people that are the reason that you have all these tickets. And once they say, oh okay, well, this person is gone, and let's get some more black people on here, and let's make some changes. Like, but the, the light bulb had to go on. Like, they had to see how that was happening and affecting their daily lives. And so I think the extent to which that connection can be made in as many other places as possible. I mean, you've got in Baltimore, for example, Stephanie Rawlings Blake is not running for re-election. Don't know what Marilyn Mosby is, is I mean, like, you don't know what's going to happen, you know, necessarily in cities like that. But for people who can see the connection and for, for places in which the connection is made, when they made the connection in Cook County in Chicago, she was gone. When they made the connection in Cleveland, that DA was gone. You know, so you know, people need to understand. And also, you know, to your point about state legislatures, so I cover the state legislature in Georgia and in Virginia um, at a time when they definitely you know, were controlled by conservatives who were passing, you know, who said, you know, we don't care about you know, abortion and guns and, and, and welfare, and then promptly, you know, st session started and they're passing all kinds of laws to make, you know, you need to get a drug test to get welfare benefits, and you know, we need to you know, address race-based race abortions, and it's like, wait, what, what's going on? You know, why is this happening? And well, it's because you had, yeah. you, know, a, you, you know, you had organizations that were running model legislation in multiple states yeah. with conservative legislatures, right. you know, that are saying, you know what, these are our priorities and this is what we want to happen. And frankly, it's a lot cheaper to run state and local races than it is to run federal races. I, I regret that we are running out of time, but I want to come back to Randy, offer you a chance not just to comment on uh, what's been said, and maybe I'm going to ask the impossible of each of you, uh, but Randy, you get a little extra time because we come back to you as well in this round um, for any sort of final thoughts. Yeah. Final thought on the question of politics and law. You know, um, Oftentimes, people distinguish very sharply between the two. Politics is behind our law. The law is just the crystallization of our politics. We saw a few months ago, we saw during the campaign, um, there was for a long time, again, in the administration of criminal law, when opioids, when heroin, had a black face, punishment. 
Mm -hmm. These are awful Come on, people. Bring it. Put them underneath the jail. Then, you know, uh, Maine, up my way, heroin abuse, mm -hmm. white face. Oh, sympathy, empathy. I'm all for it, but why the difference? Matter of politics. The whole question, the whole issue of what's going to be criminalized, what's not. How long people, what are our punishments? Those are political questions. So on the question of whether people should vote, on the question of whether people should mobilize, if we're talking about the administration, who is going to be the prosecutor? Who are going to be the judges? Right. All of those are political questions. So on the question of politics, politics, all important. Of course, law doesn't enforce itself. Somebody's That's got right. To, somebody's exactly. got to implement it. Um, I said I'm asking the impossible. For one minute, Julianne, one minute, Aaron, to wrap up. You can have your minute first. Right, because I know yours is not going to be <laughs> which is fine with me. Um, oh, now, now you're shy. <laughs> no, I, I mean, you know, I think, um, you know, we're, it, it, we're still seeing what Black Lives Matter is going to be. Uh, but I think that, um, you know, the sense of urgency that, that, that this movement has does not appear to be going anywhere. And unfortunately, the need for a Black Lives Matter is not going anywhere. I mean, you have the case in New Orleans, you know, Joe McKnight gunned down by, you know, by a motorist who, you know, we find out over the weekend 10 years ago, you know, was violent towards another motorist. So like, this is a thing that you've done, you haven't killed anyone before, but you chase someone down and beat them up. And yet, you know, you still are allowed to be, you know, to leave with no charges while, you know, they ponder what happened here Black man's dead, we need to see what happened. You know, let's, let's hear both sides, let's get all the facts. And this person is not in jail. Meanwhile, you, know, you had a case a year before, black man and another black man in a, in a road rage uh, situation. That black man you know, has been in jail, you know, awaiting his day in court. Um, you know, so the need for Black Lives Matter definitely continues. I think that you know, the coming administration does not change that for them. In any way, you know, except you know, in, in the making it making the need even more necessary, uh, you know, for them to be there. Uh, and so, you know, I think, um, you know, while we're, you know, we're going to see what what happens with this, um, you know, the question, you know, in early 2014 of, you know, is this going to be around or not? I think I think we definitely know the answer to that, and the answer is yes. Thank you, Julianne. Final thoughts. Um. What's happening right now is a question about the triumph of predatory capitalism. Predatory capitalism over communalism. And the, because when we look at the appointments heretofore of Mr. Trump, he has appointed a whole bunch of billionaires. He said he was going to clean out the swamp, but he found him some new alligators. And so, you know, Goldman Sachs and all of this. And the, the, the issue with Black Lives Matter is that America, working people, working class people, have to basically embrace a notion that Black Lives Matter. The working class white folks who voted for Mr. What, um, voted against their self-interest. He's not going to have y'all having a beer with him at mar largo Y'all grandchildren are not going to play with his grandchildren. Let's be real clear. This is a classist, and he is also a champion of predatory capitalism. And what we don't talk about in our nation enough is class and capitalism, and the extent to which the Black Lives Matter movement is not only about the assertion of black personhood, mm -hmm. but about the resistance to someone taking essentially the um, a, you know, basically the marginal wealth of an oppressed people. And the oppressed people not just being black people. Any working people who are making $15 an hour or less, people who are investing with their bodies into the building of this country, mm -hmm. those are the people who are being exploited. But when you play petty race games, people don't get it. And so I think that white people regardless of class, but most white people, if you are looking at the 1%, you have much to gain 
by embracing the Black Lives Matter movement, embracing history, and understanding how we move forward. I think it's very unfortunate that we don't know history. I think it's unfortunate that we all haven't read Howard Zen. I think it's really unfortunate that we really have not looked at the ways that enslavement built this country and how we begin to manage that. And so Black Lives Matter is the latest iteration of a cry for assertion of personhood. That, uh, but when the Movement for Black Lives has put together, and I would encourage you to go on their website and look at their working paper, when they put together a working paper that also talks about the economy and about social justice, mm -hmm. what they're really talking about is that Black Lives Matter does mean that all lives matter, but it begins with the assertion of those lives that have been sidelined, and those are black lives. Thank you so much. Um, I, we are at the end of our time together touching on the extraordinarily important subject of race and regulation, which means, of course, that we need to talk further. We need to meet again. And there is, as everybody here knows how I feel about this and how I hope we all feel about this, there's no better place to have a robust civil dialogue about really important issues than the National Constitution Center. We have been really blessed and lucky today to have three wonderful, enthusiastic, and engaged panelists on an incredibly important subject. Join me in thanking you. Thank you.